He had a, a beautific vision of Christ so that made all of his work seem like beautific. rubbish. Beautific. Beautific. Uh, you took the word beauty <laughs> and just butchered it. I think that was the cue there. I just heard the oh, word beautific. Uh, beautific. Even I'm word. sorry. A beautiful I think it's vision. a word, but it? it's, it's, it's 100% a hundred percent All right, Maddie, we're, we're rolling. I am unashamed. What about you? Welcome to Unashamed. Zach has started us off with a big word that Jace is now looking up. <laughs> for those of you that... I mean, I'm just saying I'm embarrassed for him. <laughs> too. I've used the word beauty. I've used the word beautiful. Have you ever used the word beautific? He used beatific. the word beatific, beatific in about his third I pronounced, well, he, I pronounced it wrong. It was after Brandon. he said so. magnus so. opus. What so. is it, Brandon? I think it's beatific. beatific? No, it, it's, it's a word. It's beatific. I you, yeah. like, it is an adjective that means to express or appear happy and calm, especially in a holy way. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Mm. <laughs> so we got a preach right there. How could so you not Zach, use that word? So, Talking Zach, introduce, introduce your guest. We have a guest today on Unashamed. Well, got a, I, Brandon Hudson, um, he's on the other podcast, not not yet now podcast with me. Uh, Brandon and I also serve together as pastors at a church here in our area. So I thought we'll bring him into the discussion on Colossians, and I think he'll add a, a good bit. So, uh, Brandon, uh, meet my family here. Yeah, it's good to be here, guys. And well, what's I, this I hear from, I, in the comments, I hear comments about Jace doesn't like the name of our podcast. Uh, he, he's come along. Uh, he, he likes it now. Not just now? No, I still don't. I don't like it. Uh, I think. <laughs> you know why? Because it's not now. beautific not enough for you. Well, I'm <laughs> just saying, if I saw that, not yet now, <laughs> I would think in my mind, well, when you figure it out, that's when I'll come. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I mean, if you had no go. idea what it means. Now, once you have to explain it, I love it. But yeah. I'm saying the initial reaction, if, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just I'm not going to listen to that yet now. Not yet. Not yet not now. Not yet now. Yeah, maybe, well, maybe in about a year they'll figure it out. It'll be, well, right now. Yeah. Then we can go. Well, it's like yeah. you may be completely vulnerable and transparent. <laughs> of course. Immediately when I heard that, I thought about, you know, going in with my lovely wife and, you know, trying to set the mood, you know. And if I heard that phrase, not yet, I would have never stuck around to hear the word now. Once I heard not yet, I wish, I'm like. I wish we'd have brought this up on the last podcast that Missy was on because I would have loved to have heard her response to that. Yeah, that sounds like some personal trauma you guys got to work through. Oh, there's a lot of personal trauma oh, I, here. Uh, Brandon, image, you, you may turn into counselor because many times <laughs> we start talking about holidays and Zach goes into the fetal position and, you know, starts calling for, you know, daddy. So, so Zach, we, we haven't we haven't been in the uh, studio for a while. So, I just yeah. was reminded we still have your hunk of silver here, which so I gave back. Well, not yeah, that's he right. He one. gave it back because he got him one, and so it's two ounces yeah. of silver. I don't know what silver is an ounce now. No, it's a guilty conscience. But I don't know. It says uh, <laughs> Zach, the the people that sent it from uh, Lubbock said, "I watch and I listen. I hear your passion, and I'm blessed." Seeds mm. are being oh. planted. So that was his little I message to you. I don't think I ever read that on the, but we do appreciate the oh. silver. We're holding this as a ransom till we get our gold back. So, well, what a well, beautific my... thing to say when you start this off. <laughs> well, it's my, it's <laughs> like my magnus opus, Jace. It's just like the way I roll. Ooh. Oh, come on. So. Wow. Oh, so I went modus duck... operandi. This uh, is our modus operandi, everyone. So. I went, I went duck hunting, uh, this morning. And so, uh, which is why I, we're back at the lair, by the way. We that, the That's lair. why. And we're going to visit Phil. Uh, you know, Phil's not doing well. I, I, I think I spoke on the 1000th podcast. Yep. We were kind of trying to figure out the diagnosis. But we're, according to the doctors, they're sure that he has some sort of blood disease that's causing all mm. kinds of problems. And he's had this for a few years. It's just gotten a lot worse. Yeah, it's like accelerated and it's causing problems with his entire body and uh and he has early stages of alzheimer's yep. so if you put those things together he's just not doing well he's really struggling and uh so you know he 
uh, he keeps saying, I'm going to get back to the podcast, but I'm like, well, Phil, you can barely walk around without, you know, crying out in pain. And uh, I was like, you know, your memory is not what it once was. He's like, tell me about it. <laughs> so uh, he is literally unable to, I think he uh, would agree, to yeah. just sit down and have a conversation. Mm. And he misses yeah. it. He misses uh, the stories we tell. Uh because he called me recently. You know, it's like anybody with, with Alzheimer's, and you guys, a lot of you out there in Unashamed Nation know this, you have good days and bad days. So uh, there, it's the same with Dad. There'll be some days he's a little better, you know, a little yeah. more with now, you, and other days not so much. Now, having said that, we're trying to do a lot of things to figure out how to make him more comfortable and maybe help with his memory. And so uh, he, there's a lot of different things that we're doing from doctor sessions. But, uh, you know, there's just what, – what we're hearing is, you know, outside of some supernatural intervention, yeah, which I, I don't doubt. Me neither. Uh, you know, so it I would not be happen. surprised that – but we've, we've got a team of doctors, and then we have another set of doctors who are looking at all the tests, and they're, they're all in agreement that there's no curing what he has. Right. And so mm -hmm. – uh, you know, what do you do? We, we, we're trying to make him a little more comfortable. And as if he were here, you know what he would say, boys, the resurrection looms large as you, as yep, you get man, nearer and nearer the end. So, yep. um, you know, we're, we're not uh, worried in that sense with him, but it's just one of those things we have to deal with. So just to let you guys know in the audience, because we haven't said much because we've just been kind of waiting to see what happens. Well, we didn't really know what the problem was, but we're far enough, we're far enough along the process now to know these things as facts and uh look it's well, how, how long has duck season been open uh 10 days ten, day, 10 days so 10 days ago he went with us on opening day yep but uh you know we shot 32 ducks it was one of the best opening days we've ever had but my dad did not fire his weapon nor did he say much so I knew right then. Yeah. I mean, he it was all we could do to get him out there. He wanted to go, but he just after the hunt, he said, "Jace uh, was miserable because he was just hurting yeah. and he couldn't mm -hmm. do anything." And uh, he just said, "I'll don't, y'all don't call me. I'll call you when I'm ready to go back." And uh, he hasn't called in ten days, which it's not like we hadn't talked to him. But he'll he'll say, well, "What'd y'all do today?" And uh, I'll tell him. So he's just unable. If he's unable to go duck hunting, that pretty much tells you all you need. Yeah. To know. Well, and look, this podcast is uh, has always been about being unashamed, and and Dad's the most unashamed person I've ever known, and he's now passed that legacy on to us, and so everything we do is you know he's always here. So I always say that he may not be on set, but the but the field chair is always. Yeah, there. that's true. And and look, he's like you know when you have this Alzheimer's, it's. Like some days you feel like, oh, he, you know, he's he's coming back. And then the next day, you know, you walk in and he's like, now, which one are you? <laughs> I'm like, I'm Jace. <laughs> he's like, oh, yeah. Yeah. I remember you now. So, I mean, it's, it's just, it's that's kind of where battle. we're Yeah, it's where we're I at. I mean, they, they so, all kind of, the whole, uh, that sibling group, my mom, my mom had dementia. Did they say dementia or Alzheimer's? They said, he's, he said Alzheimer's. He said Alzheimer's. That's what he said. Yeah. But, uh, you know, he did the test and all that. And yeah. So yeah. I'm getting the second hand. Willie actually went with him throughout all that. And then right. Willie called me and we kind of went play by play. But now look, having said all that, they're, they're optimistic about doing a few things to slow it down. And so we're not being doom and gloom here. It's just, it took a, a long period of time to kind of get a diagnosis because right. my dad is, just, I mean, he's hurting all over and uh, he's losing weight. Mm. And he's having this memory problem. So it was kind of hard to figure out, is one thing causing another? I mean, and so it's really those two things happening simultaneously that have produced where he's at. Right. And uh, even though he's eating, you know, pretty good, he just can't retain weight. He keeps losing weight. And uh, he just he's just not able to do much. And he's just hurting. Right. Well, I told Zach that, um, you know, when, when great men and women – um, get to a point where they're not what they once were, you know, it's hard then to make that decision about when do you kind of pull back and you're not out there doing what you used to do. And I think about 
uh, Ronald Reagan when I went to his um, um, library out in California. Because I'm a big Reagan guy and obviously had a big impact on me and his political influence. And, you know, when you go through his life and his career and really interesting and you get to the very end, they have this room that you're kind of your last stop in the library. And Reagan wrote a letter when he got to the point with his Alzheimer's that he knew he couldn't, you know, function like he used to. Yeah. So he was going to kind of step back from the public eye. And he reads that letter. You know, he was still well enough at the time, which I, was a, such a great gift to people that loved him. And then, but when he was doing it, you know, you're in tears because you're just like, man, you realize that when you get to this point, you're saying, you know, I'm, I'm not what I once was. And so, you know, I kind of feel that way with dad. He didn't write a letter, but his his letter lives on uh, in us. Wow, and so absolutely. that's the beauty of sharing the gospel and impacting people mm-hmm. is that never stops generation to generation to generation. So that's the beauty there. You know, yeah, we are the living letter uh, yeah. for dad. So No, I agree. I always think, uh, you know, when we had Allie Beth on the last podcast, of course, she did a very awesome job in that book, uh, The Toxic. Empathy, Empathy yeah. And, and kind of took cultural issues uh, that sound like something that you want to put yourself in and say, oh, well, you know, wait. And, but it's it's lacking in truth. But, you know, my dad has always had a way of just being so graphic and blunt and dumbing hmm. things down. I remember when the kind of gender crisis was full swing in our culture. You know, my dad is like, what everyone needs to do is remember one of the greatest inventions that would cure the gender crisis in our culture. Of course, I'm sitting here listening like, what is he? Get, what was invented that was going to cure the gender crisis? Because that's the way my dad is. He, he's planting a seed in your mind. You think, of all the inventions that could cure what the What kind gender of technology? Yeah. What kind? And he said, it's called a mirror. <laughs> bring back the mirror <laughs> and then he described what you do well with that then mirror. he then he got you know graphic into human anatomy yeah. on what you're seeing in the mirror which then made you a little uncomfortable but when oh, you peel all God. that back and think about it you you have to think as a human being you think you know he's got a point. He's got a point. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a modern day redneck parable. It's yeah. just yeah, like I, Jesus stuff. <laughs> That's exactly right, which you can't help but laugh. And uh, and and he has a way of kind of getting away with it, yeah. I guess, because he's even yeah. – uh, somebody made the comment in the last uh, – in the uh, I think it was when Mac was there when he was talking about people don't gasp in the audience at our church because they've already heard everything. But right. there was a time <laughs> when Phil was there when I heard – There were aud- gasps early. Yeah. I heard audible <laughs> gasp. From something that Phil would say. Dad helped de gasp WFR with some 19, of his. 1997. <laughs> the summer of 97 was quite the. I mean, those those are the lost files, but there was a ser- series that Phil gave that. Biblical whew. sexual <laughs> ethics. Yeah, I'll never forget it. Well, because what would happen to your point, uh, Brandon, was, you know, my dad has always shared Jesus with everybody that's come to his house. I mean, it, it's just going to happen whether it's the FedEx man or someone that's lost or a fisherman. You know, they had a boat dock down there. It just, it, he just had because, a way. Because his assumption was God sent you here. Exactly. And so that's when he feels that way, then so everybody's open to the same dialogue. So we had, uh, Jace, we had Allie Beth uh, Stuckey recently on the podcast talking about her book, uh, Toxic Empathy. And on there, she talked about abortion and how, you know, a lot of times the sort of the approach from the world is, is that it's better for women, you know, if they have this choice and they do it and they get on with their life and these other things, but they don't always look and see the negative effects that it has, not just on a child, obviously that, that is put to death, but also a woman and their response as well. Exactly. It becomes a negative. In fact, there's a new Danish study it shows a year after uh, abortion, a woman is exhibits a 50% higher likelihood of first-time psychiatric treatment and an 87% higher likelihood of personality and behavioral disorders. So it doesn't sound like it's very positive for women's health care. Uh, we don't believe that it is. And 
for Preborn, which is one of our sponsors, uh, here's what their women's health care looks like in their clinics. Will, women are welcome with open arms. They feel love from the moment they walk into the door. Then they're introduced to their baby on ultrasound, and they're offered life-affirming choices. When they choose life, they're offered assistance for up to two years, including maternity clothes, diapers, counseling, and so much more. Preborn treats the whole woman, body, mind, and soul, and the baby growing inside of her. So if you're looking for the greatest investment for your year-end write-offs, choose Preborn. Donating is simple, and sponsoring one ultrasound is just $28. Let's join together, help mothers choose life. To donate securely, dial pound 250 and say the keyword baby. That's pound 250, keyword baby. Or go to preborn.com slash unashamed. That's preborn.com slash unashamed. And dad would immediately like get into their life. It's like, now what are you into? And they're like, what do you mean? He's like, well, do you know what sin is? I mean, he was just real confrontational. But like I said, there was just something about him that he seemed to get away with. It, it, they didn't mm. find it offensive. Right. I mean, my dad was he'd, like. He'd, he'd say, you're going six feet under and it, with daisies popping out. Or, you know, yeah, I mean, it's language. like, and, yeah. Do you have a better idea? But a lot of these guys would share like their innermost secrets or sins well then you know they would later come to christ but then when he would he would take that story in, in a pulpit and he would share whatever graphically was was exactly. said people would be like oh, and it was like he's told the bodybuilder that time he said son you've got quite a physique and the guy pumps up you know instantly just the muscles that know, was in the parking lot in the, the parking lot building. he said you got quite the physique and the guy's like yeah and he said how are you getting it out of the ground? Yeah, I was standing right beside him. <laughs> I mean, that's the ultimate line. Right? And the guy's like, he said, if you want to know how, come down to the house. And the next day, here he comes. Oh, you know? What's funny is I was standing beside Dad when he said that, and the guy was walking. And, he, and you're right. When he said that, he kind of he kind of tore it, but he was walking. But when my dad said, well, how are you going to get it out of the ground? And he stopped. And that's my dad said, if you ever want to hear how to get it out of the ground, come down to the house. And by the way, there. dad didn't know his name, so he just called him Bumba. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he said, hey, Bumba. <laughs> and the guy was like, yeah, that's me, which is another trait of dad. He just gives you a name and that he, becomes your he name. He named Connor. Or, Connor, or one of our first uh, employees down there on the production team, uh, uh, Phil called him No Name. No Name. Because he could, so that became his name was No Name. A couple of times I said, Dad, his name is Connor. He said, yeah, No Name. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's funny about that is Phil wouldn't give him his card because he didn't have one. He wouldn't give him his cell phone note because he doesn't have one. He just said, come down to the house, which is actually a 35-minute drive from that church building. And if you don't and have you don't directions. you don't to get here, and, you're never going to find it. And two or three days later, that guy pulled up in the yard. <laughs> it probably took so, him three days to find it. I Bumba. just, I love Bumba that, that this guy figured it out on his own, mm -hmm. which shows you that that question really in impacted him, which is, you know, my dad used to call that directional dialogue. Yep. He would have conversations with people about, human problems, their sin or their death or their, you know, lack of having a good relationship with their wife or what, you know, any kind of problems like that. And he would just get their attention and tease them with a way to mm. have a better Which life. is interesting because dad took that to another level. And we used to teach this a little bit back when we were first getting started. And we had that big house in town. You and Missy had your little house on Swiss Street. Because we're teaching people how to teach other people. And so dad came up with this directional dialogue concept and he would use Jesus as an example. And Jesus would confront, you know, the Pharisees or the scribes or teachers of the law. He was really teaching the people and the disciples. The lessons he was teaching mm -hmm. were to them, but the confrontation was this way. And that's exactly the way dad would do it. Remember, he would confront. So if he was going to confront somebody, like he had a problem with Zach about something. He was sitting here. He would look at Jace and say, Jace, I'm at what's what what's the deal with Zach? I mean, he's yeah. you know, and then he would start talking 
about Zach and what Zach had been doing, but he's doing it to Jace as sure as Zach's. Oh, exactly. <laughs> Yo, he did Directional it. dialogue confrontation. <laughs> well, somebody uh, made a point. Uh, I haven't researched this, but I heard him say it, that Jesus asked over 300 questions in the four Gospels, and there's only, you know, a third of that that was asked to him. So he asked three times the questions that he w- that was actually asked of him, which you would think if he's the creator of the world in human form, that would be backwards. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it just shows you that Jesus did that through conversation and, and would listen to what they would say. And then here we go. Once he, you know. One of my favorite dad uh, directional dialogue confrontation moments came at Louisiana Tech University on the night they were honoring Bradshaw and Dad. And and I was there, of course, and it helped put it together. Dad didn't want to go. And I was like, Dad, you know, they're honoring you. Bradshaw's going to be there. You know, it's an opportunity. He's going to interview. It's an opportunity to a big audience to talk about the gospel. So he he agreed to do it. And we were up in uh, the coach's office, and they had Dad and Bradshaw signing stuff, and, you know, as you'd expect. And the president of the university walks in with his little entourage, and you know, everybody kind of quiets down, but Dad and Bradshaw just keep talking. And everybody else kind of got quiet. And so they finally, like, looked up like, oh, we got a moment here. And so the president does this whole thing. Thank you, Terry and Phil, for coming back. And, you know, your legacy here at Louisiana Tech University. And he gives a little speech. And he says, and we just want to take tonight as an opportunity. Uh, and we haven't said this publicly, but we, we want to uh, recognize Phil as the 2014 alumnus of the year at Louisiana Tech University. And everybody claps, you know. And Dad's just looking. St- cigar store Indian look. He doesn't react. Nothing, you know. And so he looks over at me. And I thought, uh-oh. Because <laughs> I've seen this before. So in this moment, you know, and he looks at me and he says, Al, you remember when we were fishing on the Washita River? And now it's quiet, you know, because because everybody's not sure is he responding to the thing or is he? I said yes, sir. He said, "Do you remember what we were getting for buffalo and catfish down there on the river? Thirty cents a thirty pound. cents a pound." And I said, "Yes, sir." He said, "Do you remember anybody from Louisiana Tech calling me and saying <laughs> you are something great?" <laughs> so I'm like, no, I don't remember that. <laughs> and so now they're kind of nervous, chuckle, you know, like, is he kidding? Is he like, because, you know, they're trying to figure out the moment. He said, all it took for me to go from an idiot to a genius was one television show. He said, now everybody loves me. What do you think about that, Alex? <laughs> I think it's great, Dad. <laughs> and so everybody's just laughing. And then Bradshaw saved the day when he jumped in. He says, Phil, they don't care about any of that stuff. They're just recognizing you, so you'll give them a big fat check. You got money now, son. <laughs> so it all came off as a joke, but Dad was not kidding. Like, yeah. he was confronting the establishment in the moment. <laughs> and it was just his way of doing it, but it's one of my all time favorites. But, but he also good. did something that I thought, you know, in his technique of, uh, of sharing Jesus with people, he would, he would always anchor it in the context of space and time. You know, he talked about Jesus. It was, it, it never sounded like a Bible story. Mm. Yeah. You know, it didn't sound like he wouldn't, he wouldn't present it like a, a Bible story. He would say something like, uh, you know, I heard him say on one of the interviews, I think it was on, uh, one of the, the today show or something. And he said, yeah, I spent most of my life, you know, first 20, Eight years or whatever, uh, drunk, high. What was it? It was. It was dr- getting, getting high, uh, getting drunk, getting drunk. laid. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> getting drunk, getting high, getting laid. And he said, until I ran smack dab in the Jesus of Nazareth, who walked on the planet Earth two thousand years ago. But the way he phrased it, I mean, it was like it wasn't like a story. He wasn't talking about a story, you know, that you read your kids a Bible story. It wasn't this? It wasn't like a fairy tale. He's taking Jesus. And putting him in space and time, he he was from a place, <laughs> you know, and then he, uh, he was from somewhere, and he anchored it in a time period two thousand years ago, mm. and I think that's so effective. And I, even our, we're at Colossians that that like like Paul does that when he's like saying that Christ lived in a body. I mean, that's kind of the whole point of the deal. 
So Phil was able to get through all the uh, all this Christianese stuff in his ministry. I mean, he didn't use any of that terminology, and I think that's why he could just cut right through to the to people who who couldn't hear that, but they could hear about this man who came from heaven and lived on planet Earth two thousand years ago, was put in a tomb and rose three days later. So that alumnus award that's still hanging in the Louisiana Tech Hall of Fame uh, down in in Ruston. Uh, his plaque is a picture of him with the beard and the bandana, and it says duck hunting icon, uh, television personality, servant of Christ. And mm. and I looked on the whole wall, and no one else mentions the name of Jesus except for one guy. Wow. And so mm. that tells you all you need to know about what's important. So Chase, I don't know if you knew this or not, but some of the best ways to let people know what you're into is to – have merchandise uh, that shows that. Did you were you aware of that? That's a good way to let people know. I think that's been going on since the bumper sticker was introduced, Al. <laughs> you you do love your bumper sticker moments, Jay. Uh, merchandise definitely is a way to let people know what you love, what you're into. And if you go to unashamedmerch.com, use our special promo code unashamed10, you're going to get 10% off the total of your order. So uh whether it's the blind mug, Love Always Protects T-shirts. Uh, I see, Jay, she got an I Ride with King Jesus mug right there in front of you. Mm-hmm. All these things say that we're into Unashamed uh, and we're into what Blaze is offering. You can also check out some of the other fun Blaze Media merchandise, like the Patriotic Collection, the Blaze Media Collection. So there's hats, stickers, mugs, sweaters, a whole lot more, a lot of fun things to let people know what you're into Head on over to unashamedmerch.com today. Use the promo code unashamed10 for 10% off your order, which is a heck of a good deal. That's unashamedmerch.com. Be sure to use the promo code unashamed10 so you can get 10% off your order. Check them out today. All right, so we're in in, uh, Colossians 3, and we kind of began to get here uh, when we had Mac on, because uh, he had had a couple of verses out here, and Jay, she read some. But before we jump into that, we never actually read those last three or four verses to tie off that idea before, because he was talking about freedom is how he introduced this thought that Jesus is Lord when we started in 2 6 down through the end of the chapter. And he says, and this sets up what we're going to be talking about today. He says in verse 20, because he's been, remember, he talked about the certain days, and there are all these things that. This mysticism and legalism and ceremonialism and a lot of isms, you know, that we've added to that. But he was basically saying, you died to that. And he gets in verse 20, he says, you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world. And that's really good, what we're going to be talking about for the next, you know, 30 verses or so. As though you still belong to it. Uh, he says, then he says, uh, why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to it, to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. And he, you know, he could have added 50 more. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence, which he makes an interesting mm-hmm. point because this is what Jesus has been talking about the whole time. He, that's why his favorite word when he talked to these people was hypocrite. And you say this, but you live like this. And so that was his whole point as he leads into that. And so then that leads into uh, Colossians chapter three, uh, which we're going to be talking about his lifestyle. So Jason, if you want, you want to read that section. All right. It says, since then you have been raised with Christ, which it had just said, in 220 since you died with Christ since you've been raised he keeps going back to this chapter 2 9 you know through that that little section right and that you died with Christ you were buried with Christ you were raised from Christ that 9 through 12 of chapter 2 yep so since then you've been raised with Christ set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, there it is again, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. 
which is quite a statement. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things, and he names a lot of others, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge, in the image of its creator. Mm. Here there's neither Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dear love, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive each other whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Quite the section. Um, and I like that it ends that section with the idea of worship. Yeah. That that's what naturally mm -hmm. comes out of a fulfilled life. You know, when you don't have the emptiness, you have the fulfillment. That becomes a natural thing for us to do. Yeah. And that's good times or bad. You know what I find offensive? Uh, you know, that's inspired word of God, you know, translated into English from the Greek. Mine's a new international version. But somebody made this a heading. Yeah. Probably somebody from Zach's theological world. <laughs> <laughs> and I just read that chapter 3, 1 through 17. Somebody put a heading above that, and, and I want to read that. You know what it says? Rules. Rules for holy living. <laughs> Terrible. Hmm. Now, you talking about missed it. <laughs> that, that's this, the exact opposite of what. <laughs> look, this is right after, right after in 213 when it says you were dead in your sins and in your uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. There's our vivification. Look it up. Having, uh, he forgave us all our sins. Look, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. Yeah. And so just a few verses later, somebody said, oh, here's some rules for holy living. <laughs> I thought that was nailed to the cross. <laughs> Yeah, they missed the they missed the point. I on think it. this was motivation, as as if Paul's saying th those rules weren't good enough. I'm giving you the better yeah. rules. If you just keep exactly. these rules, you'll you'll finally be. Mine actually says put on the new self, which I think is a far better far way to talk about. Far better, far that, better heading. That's why it's dangerous to go verse by verse, and we don't normally do that. Even though, like, we're reading big chunks, we keep referring back to the first two chapters. Right. Because he had just said the mystery of godliness is Christ in you. And then he kind of explains yeah. how that happened. Yeah. And then your old self is crucified. You died to these basic principles of the world. You're never going to be able to do enough rule keeping, you know, not handling, not touching certain things. And he was obviously talking about kind of their cer ceremonial food world with all the rules mm -hmm. that this is going to make you holy. He's like, no, you, you, you're, you're part of another world. Yeah. And uh, which is why I brought up Ephesians three with the, the vivification idea with that prayer that he prayed in Ephesians saying, you know, he was praying that you'd be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being yeah. so that Christ may be in you. So that's really what it's about. It, it's a, it's a continuation of how this is going to look in the way you operate with 
God moving in, literally moving into your body, the Spirit of Christ. It reminds me so much of the argument he makes in Romans 6, 7, and 8. He makes the same argument he's making here. When you have freedom, you also have freedom from the old life. I mean, that's the extension of what he's talking about, because that enslaves you and traps you. This lifestyle that he's describing, trust me, it may look like freedom. It's not freedom. If you're living these things he's talked about with the sensuality and the reactions and always bitter always lying, always wondering, how, did I tell this truth, that truth, and, you know, living in constant fear that my lies are going to catch up. All, everything he mentions here is an entrapment mm-hmm. of an old way of life. And he's saying, look, you've been freed from it. The newness that you have in Christ, mm-hmm. you, you've left that. Why would you ever want to go back? Yeah, exactly. Which yeah, is Dallas probably, Willard said it, said it when he talked about freedom. He said, in Christ— you are f- truly free. Like fr- you're free to do whatever you want. In fact, you can murder all that you want, which will be none at all. Mm. And and I love that because that is the real freedom is that there, is when your desire actually lines up and you can actually achieve it. Like you can actually realize whatever the desire is. And so what happens in when whenever you're you're misdirected in your desire, then you're not free. And you're slave to depravity. You're not free because you you can never achieve the thing that you want. It's like the um, that there was this, um, a movie that came out a few years ago. I think it was about the collapse of Lehman Brothers. And I may have told this story on here before. I can't remember. But um, he's asking the head, like, Honcho, what's your number? Like, what's the number that you, you would take to walk away from all of this? And the guy, like, looks at him and kind of scratches his head, and he said, more. And the problem with more is that you once you have it, you still don't have it because you always need more. And that's, I think that's the, the slave. That's why you're a slave to that, and it can never be realized. But when you're a slave to Christ, Roman 6 language gives that, right? You're, you're a slave to righteousness. You actually uh, achieve or realize the, the thing that you want, which is God. And I think that's why it ends here with worship. I think it's why in this text he goes to the core of the issue, which is identity. And, and in Christ, there is no identity as a, a economic identity. There's no slave or, or free man. There's no ethnic identity because there's no uh, Greek nor Jew. Um, there's no sexual identity because we know uh, in a, another passage, there's neither male nor female. Uh, so in, in Christ, all the, all the dividing walls, like they're gone, the things that we would draw our identity from. But the reason why is because we ultimately find our identity with with this this coming of, of the king. Yeah, and it's an idea of a new life. I, I like that this in verse three and four, the word life there, Zoe, is is the Greek word, is and it's used all over the New Testament and the Gospels, but it's the same one that John uses in John one, four, when he's talking about Jesus. In him was life Zoe, and that Zoe was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. And then he talks about him actually coming to earth as as being that life. And so the idea is, is the same life that Christ lived, we now embrace and become a part of that life. That's why it says we are hidden in him. Mm -hmm. So those Zoes combine and and collide. And what a beautiful Mm -hmm. thing for us to be able to know that, that we have that in him. Yeah, I think that secret hidden relationship that we have is we we should discuss because the only which is a poor illustration but the only place i can even relate to it is like me and my wife you know that we're we're all we've ever known i mean my wife and i we we were virgins when we got married I've, i've shared that many times but and you know all the other girls i dated i was interested it was just different here because I didn't really care what happened or what we did I just thought you know being with this woman is what I want to do I don't care what's happening right but as this relationship has gone on it's actually kind of a secret relationship because you you know a lot of times now you'll walk in I know what she's thinking before she even says it Mm. or there's just so many little Mm. moments because of this union but when you think about doing that times a thousand with with Jesus in your heart, believing God is real, 
hearing the story of Jesus and then surrendering and then him moving in through his Holy Spirit. Yeah. Well, that as it matures and grows becomes kind of like that because mm-hmm. you're you could be driving down the road and you're thinking you're having a conversation with the creator of the universe in your body. Yeah. That or you're in, you know, someone's saying uh, something and you're thinking, now how should we, how should we battle this? <laughs> you know, I, mm. so all these moments that are coming, because, you know, I, I'll give you an example of that. So when in Luke 9, when he told his disciples, you know, anyone who come after me, he must deny himself, uh, take up his cross and follow me daily. It, it, he uses that word daily. And you think, well, what was he, what was that a shadow to? Well, it was a shadow of this this new birth that could be accomplished. He did the same thing in John 14 when he starts talking about when I go to the right hand, or but he didn't. He just said, "When I leave, I'm not going to leave you as an orphan." He said, "I'm going to uh, give you my Spirit, who will be in you." And then verse 23 mm-hmm. of 14 says, "You know, if anyone obeys me and trusts me, me and my Father will make our home with them." I mean, it's like. Well, that's a dwelling, you know, it, it's a becoming a family member. It's this secret relationship mm-hmm. that's hard to describe. And I think you see that with Jesus. I mean, one time I know off the top of my head in Mark 1, of course, Mark fast forwards. He, he kind of immediately goes, you know, he skips over the baptism and all, and it just immediately goes into his ministry. So it's after all that. But all these exciting things are happening. He's called his disciples. I'll make you fishers of men. He does miracles. And then the next thing he does, it says he one more one morning he went out to a solitary place and, and he prayed. And all the disciples came up there and like, hey, everybody's looking for you. But that little secret moment with Jesus, you know, why is he doing that? And it's it's in the gospels over and over yeah. and over yeah. and over. It's because mm-hmm. he he believes this is real. Right. This is he's mm-hmm. doing the plan of the Father. He has the Holy Spirit in him. And I'm just saying that should be we should be doing that every day. Yeah. And having this relationship that's much better than any relationship you can think of. And that's the key from the John one. He brought that life here for us to be able to experience it. Yeah. I mean, that's what we get to do because mm-hmm. of him. That, that idea of hearing from God, I think so much of my life, I thought it was always going to be the spectacular. It was going to be some miracle of a healing or a great sermon or some audible voice coming to me in, in my prayer time. And what I've come to realize is it is that still small voice. A, a marriage is such a good illustration of that um, because you know early on, you're, you're doing these massive dates and these big shows of, of, of passion to show that you love one another. But as you've been with each other for 20, 30 years, I, we can finish each other's sentences. That's There's it. questions I don't even have to ask my wife because I know the answer to them. So I can just move from the confidence of that relationship as if she were there with me. And that really is the type of relationship we develop with God over time as we get to know him, as his spirit comes alive in us. And as the text says, as we put to death those things that are deadening the life that he's offered to us. Yeah, and it's the only thing on earth other than our relationship with him, which is heaven and earth, where two become one, as you describe, mm-hmm. into this life. And I think that's why he uses these phrases, you know, your hearts and your mind. He puts them here, and it, it made me think about that that commandment that he said, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The, the essence of who you are at every element is what makes this relationship work. And the closest thing we do have is is our relationship with our spouse, but even it pales compared to this one. Yeah. And and one makes the other so much better. I mean, you think about yeah. it, if you can yeah. get this right with Jesus with this hidden life in Christ, think about how much that makes your life with your spouse and then the legacy that you leave with your children, grandchildren and beyond to continue the process, which of course is where he's going later in this text mm-hmm. as well. Well, he says earlier in, in, in Colossians that, um, I'm trying to find the language, that like we were enemies in our minds, um, we were alienated from Christ in, in our mind, and, and I think about when you, when, you know you're, when you know you're an adversary of somebody or you know you've done them wrong, probably that's a better way of saying it, if I know that I've 
done something to you. Like if I've been talking bad about you, when I get around you, I'm like, I feel weird. Like I, I can't like, I can't really engage you because mm-hmm. I know what, I know what I've done. I know what I've said about you. And in, in a much more profound way, like we're enemies of Christ in our mind in that way. And so this language of Colossians 3, it's very similar to the language that Peter uses when he talks about baptism, because Peter says that baptism, he says it's not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but it's a pledge of a good conscience towards God. And so there's that idea, like like in my mind, in my conscience, like I'm coming to, to, to God and I'm pledging a good conscience. Well, well how in the world am I ever going to do that knowing what I've done? knowing what's in my heart, I can't pledge a good conscience towards God. But he further explains it, Peter does, by saying it saves you by the resurrection. So the language here, and this ties into your Romans 6 that you brought up earlier, Al, um, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above. So the union with Christ, the cleansing of the conscience, the not being uh, uh, alienated in your mind because of your sin, like that happens by getting connected with the resurrection of Christ, which is what baptism symbolizes. Romans 6, you you die with Christ, you're buried with Christ, and you're raised with Christ to live a new life. So the language, you, you're right, it's it's very similar. So I, I love how it starts off here. It gives us a really tangible mm-hmm. um, understanding of how in the world can a sinner like me ever, ever put on a new self. Well, you, you do it. In Christ, yeah, and I think the the mistake a lot of people make is they try to empty the tank before they allow God to fill them instead of the other way around. In other oh, words, yeah. once I'm filled, once once I know who Christ is, once the Spirit of God is living in me, and I have something of substance, then the emptying can begin because the fulfillment yeah, comes yeah, first. And so good. I think so many people look the other way around. They say, "Well, you know, just give me some time." Let me work on some me, things in my get life. It right. Let me get some things right, and then then I'm going to come and show up, and, man, it's going to be gangbusters. And you're like, man, dude, you're going to be waiting a long time if you're trying to clear out your own sinfulness. You cannot do hey, it. Man. It's impossible. So, I'd like to read this. So, look, uh, I told you a few weeks ago about the big lineman, the NFL player, mm-hmm. you know, coming to Jesus in his bye week. He came to my house. Well, we're – I told him, read the book of John. You know, I mean, we baptized him. He's fired up. He sent me at least 100 biblical questions. And so <laughs> that last night, so we're, I guess, what's that been, three weeks ago? He, he's gotten to John 14. So we've a- I've answered 100 questions. <laughs> <laughs> to, to chapter 14. But, but I thought this was interesting to our discussion. Because here's a guy who's excited. Yeah. He's new in the faith. His old self has been crucified. He's filled, man. And I'm, I'm sensing it because every time he sends me a text, it's like, what about that? What did he mean by that? But he, he's doing it in excitement. Yeah. So he sent me this text. He said, in John 14, when Jesus is talking about the Father's house, his Father's house, God's house, what's he referring to by the many rooms? So that was the question. And just for you... Uh, listening, so John 14 says, do not let your hearts be troubled. And, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because now we're fast forwarding over to Colossians 3 where it says, set your hearts on things above. Mm-hmm. So he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. So that's what he was asking. If it were not so, I would have told you I'm going there to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Now, we all know when this is usually read. It's usually at a funeral. Mm -hmm. But if you read Colossians 3, 1, 4 and read this and factor in that later on in John 14, he would say in verse 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. Mm -hmm. He then says in verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. 
Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. So then the verse I mentioned earlier, that 23, he says the same kind of thing about my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. But if you keep reading 15, chapter 15, chapter 16, he keeps discussing this Holy Spirit he's going to pour out. Correct. After he is no longer here, which he goes to the right hand of God. So I want to read you my response to him, which this it's, was off the it top. It should have of been a head. real short. It should have said, Oh, that's the mansion over the hilltop. No, it wasn't. Okay. So here's my response. So I said, On John 14, he uses an illustration of what is going to happen after he would leave the earth. And then I put in parentheses, which happens in Acts chapter 1. Yep. Remember, he leaves, he mm-hmm. tells the disciples mm-hmm. he's going to clothe them with the Holy Spirit. I said, and, and chapter 2. Chapter 1, he ascends to heaven to represent us in heaven. Chapter 2, he pours out his Spirit on those who surrender to him, humans representing him on earth. That's why the rooms, this was a reference to the original Jewish nation in the Old Testament where representatives would go to various rooms offering sacrificing sacrifices, acting as priests for the sins of the Jewish nation. Of course, then I put in parentheses, I realize this can be very confusing. However, the book of Hebrews explains this in detail. Yeah. And I said, read Hebrews 3, 6 just to see a glimpse of what I'm saying. And y'all remember uh, Hebrews 3, 6, where uh, the Hebrew writer says, Jesus is better than Moses because, and he starts talking about God's house. And he says, we are the house of Christ. What does that exactly say, Hebrews 3, 6? Yeah, 3, 4 says, For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. And then verse 6 says, But Christ is faithful as a son over God's house. Yeah, and we are his house. So in the Old Testament, under the Jewish nation, they had an actual house. Right. So let me continue. I'm almost done. So then I say, So now go back to John 14. This all makes sense when you read chapter... John 14, chapter 15, and chapter 16. Those three chapters talk about Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. But he will represent us in heaven, but promises to give us his spirit to be in us, which I put in all caps, to be in us. Read John 14, verses 16 through 19 and 23, which I just did. So the point is the rooms coincide with Jesus being the fulfillment of the commandments, the rules, the priests, the temple, And through his death, burial, and resurrection and presence in heaven, he is actually making God's presence available for humans since he is still a human, even though he has been glorified in a new eternal body. So now read Hebrews 9, 24 through 28, and I want to read that because none of what I've said makes sense until you read this. So when you read 9, 24 through 28 of Hebrews, it says, Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Then Christ would have to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself, just as man is destined to die once, which Phil always zeroed in on. And after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. He will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. And the reason I read all that is because when people see that phrase, set your mind on things above where Christ is seated, that seems kind of crazy. And just like he thought, well, what's this house he's talking about with all these rooms? 
Yeah, exactly. All right, we're out of time. We'll uh, you brought out a lot there. There's <laughs> a lot more I want to say about it. Well, once so, I start- so we're, we're going to save that for the next podcast. We'll have our response. We'll I see. didn't realize my response was that lengthy <laughs> to my young San Francisco uh, <laughs> new brother. He's probably still studying it. We'll see you next time on Unashamed. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.